Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Heather Berlin. She is an associate clinical professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, New York City. She explores the neural basis of impulsive and compulsive psychiatric and neurological disorders with the aim of developing novel treatments. She is also interested in the brain basis of consciousness, dynamic and conscious processes, and creativity. And today we're focusing mostly on impulsive and compulsive disorders, consciousness and unconscious mind, dynamic and conscious processes, and toward the end a little bit about science communication as well. So Dr. Berlin, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. So starting then, as I mentioned in the introduction, with impulsive and compulsive disorders. So I I know that there are differences there between those two different kinds of disorders. So first of all, what are impulsive disorders? Impulsive disorders um, involve um, behaviors that are done without a lot of foresight, that are done um, sort of in the moment without a lot of self-control. Um, so impulsivity can be a symptom within certain disorders, um, but you know there's a lot of overlap between impulsive and compulsive disorders. I- impulsive disorders tend to be more of where you do something for an immediate pleasure, right? To gain something despite the consequences. Um, so you'll act out for your immediate pleasure, say, um, or avoidance of pain, despite the future consequences of your actions. Um, but compulsive disorders or compulsivity, which can be a symptom within disorders, tends to be more like engaging in a behavior to remove a negative feeling. So for example, if you are experiencing some anxiety, um, you know, maybe biting your nails makes you feel a little bit better it removes the anxiety. So you're not sort of doing it to get pleasure seeking, to get a high, like sensation seeking, which tends to be more in line with the impulsive um, behaviors, Uh, but it's more to reduce a negative feeling. So with something like obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, you might have an obsession like, oh, I'm going to catch a horrible disease and that causes you anxiety. So to compensate for that, you'll engage in a compulsive behavior, which might be to wash your hands over and over again, because that somehow relieves the anxiety that's been produced by the obsession that you're going to get a disease. So, but there's a lot of overlap between, you know, sometimes it's very hard to distinguish if a behavior is impulsive or compulsive. Sometimes it's a little bit of both, like in pathological gambling, you know, some people are gambling in order to regulate a negative emotion, right? They, they feel sad or depressed and they gamble to feel better, but some also, it also involves maybe getting a little bit of a high, getting some dopamine and pleasure from it. So it can kind of, there's, it's muddy waters there and it can be a bit of both. And when it comes to how we understand these disorders, are some impulsive and compulsive disorders psychiatric and others neurological in basis or how does it work exactly? You know, so I always thought that there that this sort of distinction between um, psychiatry and neurology is 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 a bit artificial or kind of arbitrary um, because the mind is the brain, and you know the brain is the mind, and so any kind of what's considered a psychiatric disorder or say like a mental health disorder is going to be tied to some neurological issue. Ultimately, we just might not know yet what it is or how to measure it, right? But we're starting to understand the neural basis of these psychiatric disorders. So I often, a lot of my work was um, working within the departments of both neurology and psychiatry. Um, But, you know, it it tended to be that neurological disorders were like sort of purely organic in nature. Like we can see there's some underlying brain dysfunction that causes the disorder, say, you know, Alzheimer's, or autism, Um, but there's overlap there, right? And so, and and mental health issues like say depression or anxiety have a neural basis. 
So I think these two disciplines are really intimately related. Um, but some things are still like purely in the neurological category, like epilepsy or stroke, you know, brain tumors, things like that. But they also inherently can have some mental health consequences. People with Parkinson's disorder can have other psychiatric symptoms along with it. So again, it's not a clear boundary between the two. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the neural bases, how much do we know about the neural bases of impulsive and compulsive disorders? Um, we know we know quite a bit. Uh, we know that you know it involves certain parts of the prefrontal cortex. It seems to be that with impulsivity, you have sort of decreased activation of part of the prefrontal cortex, the orbital prefrontal cortex in particular, um, but with compulsive behavior, you have overactivation of that part of the brain. So it's like leads to rumination and anxiety. So it's kind of a dysfunction, but in one, one side it's sort of underactive and the other it's overactive. There's also issues with differences in neurocircuitry, um, things involving subcortical areas like the basal ganglia, um, which tends to be involved in the compulsive behaviors. Um, but we we are we really are as particularly with those kinds of disorders are um, understanding a lot about the underlying brain dysfunction. And you mentioned the orbital frontal cortex there. So as far as I understand it, it is related to things like impulsivity, time perception, and emotion and reinforcement sensitivity, right? And those are the things that play a role here in impulsive and compulsive disorders, correct? Yeah, that was um, some of my original PhD research was in looking at the functions of the orbital frontal cortex mm -hmm. and showing that it is involved in impulsivity, also in time perception. Um, so people who are impulsive have a faster subjective sense of time, or it feels like if you have to wait for a reward, it feels much longer than you know, the waiting might, might feel it's only two minutes. It might feel like 10 minutes subjectively. Um, and I, you know, some of the work they did showed how the orbital prefrontal cortex is involved in emotional dysregulation or emo emotional regulation when it's working well. Um, and reinforcement sensitivity has to do with how sensitive you are to the reinforcers, say the rewards of some doing something. Um, and we did a paradigm looking at reward contingencies. And when people have lesion to the prefrontal cort the orbital prefrontal cortex in particular, they get deficits with reward sensitivity, emotional regulation, time perception, they become more impulsive. So we did a, I did a series of studies where I compared precise neurological lesion patients to psychiatric patients on a variety of measures to compare orbital prefrontal cortex function to dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex function. Mm -hmm. So let's go here through some examples and perhaps at least one of them you've already mentioned there at a certain point, but through some examples of disorders that really fall within these impulsive slash compulsive categories. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about kleptomania and pyromania and perhaps their disruptive impulse control and conduct uh, disorder type aspects? Yeah, you know, there are these behaviors that people engage in where they can't seem to stop themselves from doing it. So kleptomania is stealing, pyromania is setting fires, um, that, um, you know, certain conduct disorders as well, conduct disorder where you're, um, engaging in these maladaptive behaviors, despite the consequences, you can't seem to stop yourself. There seems to be a sort of addictive element to it or a high, you're getting a reward from doing it, you're getting this bit of dopamine response. Um, people who are self-harmers, so they cut themselves, they tend to do that impulsively as well. Um, so these are sort of negative behaviors that have potentially, you know, terrible consequences, yet people can't seem to stop themselves from doing it because the sort of pleasure they're getting out of it is, seems to be too great. And again, it's either to do with emotional regulation to help regulate negative emotions or just 
sensation seeking, pleasure seeking. So there's perhaps elements of impulsivity, but also compulsivity here. Right. Yes. Yeah. There is a lot of overlap. And in the DSM, they were called impulsive compulsive disorders. Uh, so they kind of like acknowledge that it's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. And what about OCD, that is obsessive compulsive disorder? Because this one has compulsive in its name. So, I mean, what makes it uh, special in terms of uh, mental disorder? Yeah, um, obsessive compulsive disorder is uh, thought of as, it used to be thought of as an anxiety disorder. Now I think it's in its own category, um, but it involves anxiety in the sense is that you have these anxiety producing thoughts that are intrusive thoughts that you can't seem to stop or get rid of. And as a result, uh, people often engage in these compulsions to ease the tension that's being uh, produced by the thoughts and they could be behaviors they could also be mental compulsions that people do like internal counting um but there's different types of ocd there's checking you know there's a lot of uncertainty involved i'm not sure like did i turn off the light did i turn off the stove i better check i need to check and they can't seem to close that loop where it feels like there's something off constantly. So they keep me checking because it just doesn't feel right. There's this type of just rightness where it feels, everything, things feel off and it has to be just right to feel okay. If, if all the pencils are lined up and one is a little off, that can produce a lot of anxiety. So they just need to make it just right to feel better. So um, there are also, you know, contamination type OCD where people think they're going to get a disorder there's there's types of ocd where people are uncertain whether they're they're homosexual or not there's re relationship ocd where people become obsessed with relationships that they're in um so it's all different types but the the commonality is that it involves compulsion uh, obsessions and compulsions to ease the anxiety mm -hmm. And there are different degrees of OCD, right? I mean, there are perhaps people that are, I mean, obsessed with just small things, but not too much. But then there are other people who perhaps can't leave their homes if they don't check 10 or 20 times that they've locked the door or if it's con a contamination related, they have to wash their hands 20, 30 times to be sure that they have not, they are not contaminated with any kind of germs and stuff like that. So there are degrees of this disorder, correct? Right. There are different like sort of subtypes of OCD. And then there are mm -hmm. differences in terms of intensity. So there's yeah. mild, moderate, and severe. Um, so people can vary in how intense these obsessions are and the compulsions. You know, some people shower for three hours, they can't get out of the shower, you know, so some people can't leave the house. So there's different levels of, um, you know, severity. Mm -hmm. And another kind of uh, disorder, in the, let's say, is uh, hypersexual behavior. So what is hypersexual behavior and in what ways does it link to sexual impulsivity? That is the important bit here since we're talking about impulsive and compulsive disorders yeah hypersexual you know behaviors are just sort of you know these behaviors that are taken to the extreme um and it 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 tends to be Im impulsive it's like <clears throat> a lot of people who are also obsessed with like pornography or just having multiple sexual partners or they just can't, you know, help themselves kind of, it's the same, would be the same thing as if somebody just can't help themselves from gambling, even though they're losing all their money. So some people can't help themselves from cheating on a significant other and ruining their lives, but they just, this arousal that they're getting from, you know, being sexual is, is so attractive to them is so pleasurable that they're willing to forego, um, you know, a lot of things in order to achieve that high. And so it's very similar to the other impulsive behaviors. 
some people are addicted to the internet. Like they want to just be online all the time, despite ruining relationships, you know, or the stealing or setting fire. So being sexually promiscuous, let's say, or being obsessed with, um, you know, sexual, uh, you know, stimuli is a similar, um, the similar brain mechanisms are involved to other impulse control disorders. It's just the object of their desire is what's different. And I guess that when it comes to impulsivity across these different disorders that we've talked about here, like kleptomania, pyromania, hypersexual behavior, and so on, one common theme is the fact that people usually do what they want regardless of the consequences, even if they are potentially aware of them, right? Exactly. You can be aware of the consequences, but still do it anyway, um, because the reward is like sort of overpowering you. So it's, it's, you know, most people can have an urge, but they can override it. Right. Um, but in this case, they have the urge and they can't seem to override it. Mm -hmm. And then still related to impulsivity and compulsivity, there's a cluster B personality disorder. So what are these kind of disorders and in what ways do they relate to impulsivity and compulsivity? Cluster B personality disorders have to do with dysfunction of, well, like a pattern of behavioral dysfunction mm -hmm. um, that involve people who are either like overly dramatic, um, overly emotional, um, have unpredictable or impulsive behavior. So the types of disorders in this um, group are borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. Um, and they tend to involve, again, a lack of regulation of emotions, unpredictable or impulsive behavior, and <clears throat> some kind of dramatic behaviors. Um, of, or sort of characteristic of the disorders in this category. Mm -hmm. uh, borderline personality disorders specifically, isn't it a subtype of uh, bipolar disorder? Or No, I mean, no. <clears throat> there are differences in like the origins of where these, the kind of the names of these disorders came from, but okay. it's really not like bipolar disorder. Um, it's different. And bipolar disorder, you have these periods of like depression and then you'll have like a depressive episode and then you'll have a manic or a hypermanic episode. This is a bit different. This is um, people who are, ha have a fear of abandonment um, or being alone, of, of a fear of rejection or perceived rejection. Um, they have usually an unstable sense of self or like self-identity an instable self-identity um they are tend to be impulsive like do risky behaviors like they're sexually promiscuous or stealing or you know gambling or binge eating um a lot of them tend to self-harm mm -hmm. uh which tends to be an impulsive behavior they have emotional dysregulation so they can get triggered and it's very hard for them to self-regulate. Um, but a lot of it has to do with instability in relationships. So, um, and they can go from like intense loving to intense hating of the same person very quickly based on like say perceived slight or something like that. Um, they're a very difficult group to work with. They can be very dramatic, very manipulative. Um, they're often charismatic and can be a very attractive. Um, about 75% are women, but they're also men with borderline personality disorder. Uh, but it tends to be lifelong, the, all the personality disorders, because they're like sort of fundamental dispositions. Mm -hmm. So it's not like here, take this medication and we can like cure you, you know. Right. And is there any relationship between borderline personality disorder and 
schizotypal personality disorder? Um, schizotypal tends to be, that's in the cluster A, I believe. And, and that's more like unusual thinking and flat emotions. I mean, I call, you know, it's sort of like, I mean, some people would say like schizophrenia light, but you know, it's not, it's not schizophrenia, but it's strange behavior, strange ways of thinking, social anxiety, um, they have a very flat affect. Uh, so, you know, but they have sort of magical thinking and, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's different than borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned at a certain point there that when it comes to borderline personality disorder and I guess other kinds of cluster B personality disorders that uh, people have them for life and there's not really, uh, for example, medical treatment that out there for people to just do away with them. But are there still uh, treatments for this kind of disorders and even more broadly for impulsive and compulsive uh, disorders? Um. So like, you know, with the personality disorders, they're very hard to treat. You kind of just have mm -hmm. to manage the symptoms. Yeah. With, with the impulsive and compulsive disorders like OCD, there's the SSRIs, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which can help uh, treat the obsessions and, and the compulsions. There's also some use of anti-epileptic drugs to help with OCD mm -hmm. um, and compulsive behaviors and impulsive behaviors. Some have looked at these um, drugs that are used to treat like opioid abuse, um, like naltrexone and um, naloxone, because they they blunt the like pleasure response that you get. So, for example, like if you gamble, it won't feel as good, and maybe you won't want to do it as much. So there are certain treatments like that, but it tends to be that the first line treatment are the SSRIs or the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, and then if that doesn't work, there are other techniques. Ultimately, for some treatment for OCD where nothing else has worked, there's deep brain stimulation where you actually implant electrodes to treat uh, the to treat the symptoms. And those are in more extreme cases. And SSRIs that are the same used uh, for the treatment of depression, right? Yes. Yeah, they, they tend to treat depression and anxiety. So yeah. they can be used for both. Um, they're sort of anti-anxiolytic and anti-depressant. Mm -hmm. And so getting into another topic now, you also study consciousness and the unconscious. So... To introduce the topic here, could you tell us a little bit about the history of human conceptualizations about the unconscious and how they might have influenced current theories that we have about consciousness? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, hold on, I went out of focus. Okay. Um, I mean, it's a very long history, but why don't we start with, I think Freud was one of the, you know, early proponents of this idea that the unconscious exists and that it can actually influence our behavior. You know, Jung had a kind of another view about the unconscious, but I think what, and there was some overlap and, and Janae was another uh, who, who talked about the unconscious and kind of hypnosis and things along that line. But, but I think Freud was very good at starting to sort of unpack the science of the unconscious and like break it down. I mean, he was a neuroscientist. So he ultimately thought like, this is instantiated in the brain somehow. We just don't know how. Um, and so while not everything he said was right, I think he got a lot right given the, tools that he had at the time and the lack of knowledge that they had, you know, from, from just simple human observation, he, he really did get a lot, right? Like suppression and repression and dissociation, these defense mechanisms and this concept of an ego and, 
um, this sort of tripartite, you know, tri the, the, the tripartite, like the, there's the unconscious, there's the pre-conscious, there's consciousness, there's, you know, pre-conscious sort of like things that you could sort of remember. They're not conscious now, but you can easily pull them up. And the deeper unconscious, the dynamic unconscious is stuff that it's very hard to get to. And you can only get there by, you know, hypnosis or in dreams or, you know, in these deep states, um, maybe with certain drugs, right? And, but yet these things that are relegated to the unconscious are affecting our behaviors in ways that we might not be aware of. And part of therapy is to kind of bring them up into consciousness. So, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I wrote this paper on the um, neural basis of the dynamic unconscious, which looked at modern neuroscience and tried to map it out on, to understand the neural basis of some of these classic psychoanalytic concepts um, to do with like repression and suppression and dissociation and defense mechanisms. And like I said, some of it has um, been bear out, borne out and it we can see that there is a real neural basis and some of it, he was off, but I, you know, I think the concept of the unconscious goes back a bit further, but I think Freud really pulled it into the sort of our modern modern kind of conceptualization about the unconscious. But what is the dynamic unconscious exactly, since you talked about it there? It's sort of like some people call it the, the hot unconscious versus the cold one. So like meaning that what you're not conscious of right now, like I can show you a picture and then there's a hidden image of it. And I can say like, oh, were you conscious? Did you see this or not? And then I point it out to you like, oh, now I can see it, right? Um, but you weren't conscious of it before, you were unconscious of it, but it didn't have deep meaning to you, right? And dynamic is this idea of like things that are laden with emotion and with about previous relationships and, you know, they're affecting you in different ways. And so sometimes it's called like the hot unconscious, right? It has, a, it has an emotion and meaning and purpose and drive versus just, do you see it or don't you see it? Is it, are you aware of something versus are you quote unquote unconscious or not aware of it, but it doesn't have a deeper meaning. And what do we know about the neural basis of consciousness at this point? There are a couple of main, there, there's a number of theories. We do know a lot, but there's still a lot we don't know. And, okay. you know, I think um, we, there was this big um, research sort of paradigm that was comparing some of the big major theories of the neural basis of consciousness against each other experimentally the integrated information theory and the global neuronal workspace theory of consciousness. Um, but basically, and there wasn't a clear winner. Um, and there are other, there are other theories as well. There, there are a number of theories of the neural basis of consciousness, but what we do know is that there seems to be um, parts of the prefrontal cortex that are needed um, in these feedback loops. Um, but some proponents say it's more happening in the back of the brain, uh, in the primary sensory areas. Uh, so it's still, we, it's still controversial, controversial. We still don't know. Some people would talk about this 40, 40 Hertz oscillations that were needed, um, in terms of the way the neurons are firing, the pattern of firing. So we still don't know, but a lot of the experiments look at like when you see something versus when you don't, and nothing else has changed in the physical environment. And then suddenly you see it, like what's changed in your brain and can we track that? And that's what people are starting to try to investigate. Uh, by the way, you mentioned their integrated inf the integrated information theory of consciousness. And just a few months ago, there was this sort of uh, open letter signed by, I don't, I don't know how many, more than a hundred, uh, some very prominent people labeling it as a form of pseudoscience. And by the way, I just recently interviewed Dr. Anil Seth on the show, and we talked about his very interesting take on it that he wrote for Nautilus, if I remember correctly. And uh, I think that you also shared his opinion on Twitter, right? So, I mean, you think more along, more or less along the same lines about this issue, correct? Right? 
Yeah, so I, I, I really, I know very well um, all the key players in that and um, have worked with um, Christoph Koch, who, who uh, is a proponent um, together with Julia Tononi um, of the Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness. And I was actually just mm -hmm. at a meeting with the two of them a few weeks ago. We were talking about this issue with the letter. The open letter was written, well, was started in, by someone named Hakuan Lau, who I actually was a graduate student with at Oxford. We were graduate students together. And um, I, think, I think Hakuan sort of took it a little bit too far. And um, it doesn't really help the field as a whole, because if people look into our field, which is already seems precarious, like, oh, the neural studying consciousness, you know, the neural basis of consciousness, it took a long time for the scientific community to take the scientific study of consciousness seriously. And then when there's this infighting within the discipline, it doesn't really, you know, help the field as a whole. Um, it is not pseudoscience. And, and I was going to quote, and, and Neil is, a, is a, a colleague and a dear friend who I've known for many years, and we've had many conversations about this. And I, you know, I think his take is good. I, I, I was going to say that before you mentioned him that, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not pseudoscience. You can disagree with the theory. But it's being, you know, tested and there are some valuable things that we can learn from it. So I, I think some people who signed that letter might might be regretting it a bit. But um, I think it's just sort of this rivalry that's really happening between these theories. And um, there's a big divide between what's happening in the world of pseudoscience and what IIT is trying to. Um, and they have very good experiments that are being conducted and um, a variety of areas that are really contributing to, to the science. And maybe IIT will end up wrong in terms of the theory, but the, the methodology that's being used to test it is valid. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I'm, I will refer again to my interview with Dr. Anil Seff. By the time this interview is out, it will already be out and we go through some of his main arguments, which are very interesting on Nautilus. So, um, but going back to some other questions about consciousness. So where exactly is the relationship between conscious awareness and the unconscious mind? And I mean, is there uh, neurologically and cognitively speaking, is there a strict division between what is conscious and what operates uh, subconsciously? Not really. We don't know, right? We don't know. I, I think that's the real answer. Um, some would like to believe that, yes, there's this very clear boundary between what's happening in the brain and when something is conscious versus when it's not. Yeah. And I think that the boundary is probably a bit fuzzy. And, and I think that's what the research bears out is that there is a little bit of a gradation there when things are just about conscious or almost conscious, or if you're told to guess, then you're at a greater than chance level of guessing that something is there. Right. And so something is getting in. Um, we don't, we don't really know even what the neural basis of consciousness is yet much less the sort of liminal, you know, the, the line between which something is unconscious and conscious. So I think we're far away off from, from being able to understand that we're starting to understand a bit more about the neuro circuits that are involved and, um, but, but it's very fuzzy. Um, I would assume that, yeah, there are certain parts of things. There's some operations in the brain that we're just never really that consciously aware of on, on their own. But there are certain things that you can then start to attend more to and you become more consciously aware of. So, you know, nothing is, is off limits. Um, it's just about how much processing gets done after the fact. You know, if there's minimal amount of like neural activity and brain processing likelihood, you probably won't be consciously aware of it. But as the information starts to spread across different brain areas, we tend to be able to perceive it more consciously. But I wouldn't say that there is a line between conscious and unconscious, but the truth is we don't know. So I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. So this sort of already partially answers my next question, but does the brain classify and sort 
its different functions into conscious or unconscious processes? I mean, I don't think the brain <laughs> consciously does that. Uh, yeah. Um, I think consciousness is, we're, we're, we're most likely conscious of only very little bit of what's happening in the brain. Most of it is happening unconsciously. You know, this myth that we only use 10% of our brain, that's not true, but mm -hmm. we use all of our brain. It's not redundant. Um, right. But we're probably only conscious of a very little bit of it. And you wouldn't want to be conscious of everything happening in your brain. It would be overwhelming. It would be too much. It's adaptive that we're not conscious of everything or that we don't remember everything. It would be too overwhelming for us. So you want to be able to forget. You want to relegate things to the unconscious. So we're only aware of a very sliver. And it takes more cognitive energy. It takes more brain power to make something be conscious than unconscious, right? When we're at rest, when we're daydreaming, when we're sleeping, when, you know, things start to fade away from consciousness um, because we're not fully aroused and awake and everything is attending to something and creating these conscious perceptions. So uh, I would say most of what's having the brain is unconscious and very little is conscious. And we still can't though clearly determine which parts of the brain are involved in which. Mm -hmm. Uh, going back to the dynamic unconscious for a second, do we know anything about its neural basis? Well, we know a little bit about, uh, you know, and I had written in this paper about kind of the neural processes. Like it's not, there's one place, it's not like one place in the brain where mm -hmm. this dynamic unconscious lies. Um but we know a little bit about the mechanisms behind suppressing an emotion or a memory. So if you have, say, amygdala activation that's involved in emotions or hippocampal activation involved in memory, you can see a process by which there's, there's activation of certain areas of the prefrontal cortex that downregulate the hippocampus or the amygdala and kind of keep those memories and emotions at bay, keep them relegated to the unconscious. So we can sort of see an active process in the brain involved in these sort of defense mechanisms or involved in keeping things outside of awareness. And when you release that suppression, then, or you turn down the prefrontal cortex in certain ways, things come up out of the unconscious into consciousness. So, you know, things like during, when you're drinking, right, it lowers activation of certain parts of the prefrontal cortex. When you're sleeping, when you're in doing hypnosis, when you're relaxed and meditating or daydreaming, and you can decrease activation of the prefrontal cortex, you release the suppression and it allows some of these emotions and memories and thoughts that were previously relegated to the unconscious, it allows them to come up into consciousness. So we're starting to learn a little bit more about this dynamic in the brain. So th does that relate in any way to perhaps some of the defense mechanisms that Freud uh, pointed to? I mean, since you're talking there about uh, suppression, for example, of course, I'm not sure if you're using the term there with the same meaning that Freud would attribute to it or not. Yeah, I, I do. And in, and in this paper, I really do link it to the Freud, Freud's concept. So mm -hmm. with Freud, the concept of suppression is when you actively consciously relegate something to consciousness. So you say like, you know, I have a big test today. I'm not going to think about that fight. I just had with my significant other. I'm going to push it away. You're consciously pushing something outside of awareness. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, people say compartmentalization. I'm going to compartmentalize that, put it in a box and not think about it for now. <laughs> and that's an active conscious pro process. Repression is more of when things get relegated to the unconscious and that happens unconsciously. So you're not even aware that it got sent off <laughs> into this deep, dark storage area. That's controversial. That's where these ideas of like recovered memories come into play, you know, um, where let's say something so traumatic happened when you were a child that your brain wouldn't even allow you to remember it, it just pushed it into the unconscious. And then but it's still lingering there, maybe causing you symptoms or some anxiety or other behavioral symptoms. 
until it's sort of uncovered in therapy or with the use of drugs, you know, we're using like psychedelic psychotherapy now to access these otherwise repressed um, memories or emotions that are causing too much anxiety that the brain doesn't allow it to come into consciousness because it would be maladaptive. A lot of these defense mechanisms are adaptive. It makes sense to be able to keep things out of consciousness so you can function, so you can survive, so you can work and get your food and, you know, the rest of it. But they can also, anything that is adaptive when it's used too much can become maladaptive. And so that's part of what happens with certain psychiatric illnesses. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the importance that people in uh, psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy attribute to perhaps, let's say, retrieving some of those repressed or suppressed memories or information that we might have in our, our unconscious, the importance they give uh, to doing that in terms of, uh, I mean, going through a, thera a therapeutic process, uh, there's something to it, right? Scientifically yeah. speaking. Yeah. yeah, there is. And I think you're, you're able, if you're able to <laughs> bring cer certain things into consciousness and reprocess them in a way that they are not so anxiety provoking so you can have the memory but without all of the horrible emotions that are tied to it and then it and then you're able to like remember it objectively and it doesn't mm -hmm. distract you from you know your daily life mm -hmm. so uh one final question about uh, consciousness and then i have uh, another one about science communication but is there a link between on the one hand the consciousness and the unconscious and on the other hand creativity yeah yeah and so i've got really interested in that in um trying to understand the neural basis of creativity and a lot of creativity comes from these dynamic unconscious processes and when we are in our fully conscious state our brain kind of acts to filter our thoughts so that they are conforming to social norms and to expectations. And creativity comes when you have these novel associations between ideas. And often when you remove that filter system, it allows for this, like a larger repertoire of possible brain states and for these novel connections between ideas, which is creativity. And the unconscious is, is sort of limitless. Consciousness is very energy consuming and it's, it has a limit. It's very precise, um, but limited. The unconscious is less precise, but limitless. And it, it can process many more variables um, at, outside of awareness. And so there's this whole idea of like, if you take in all the information consciously and then you rel don't think about it, let the unconscious work on it. And then suddenly you come up with like a flash of insight or whatever. It's like your unconscious was working on it. And then it sort of presents to you a solution or an answer or something. So like, if you have something you want to work on, like I was just doing that now. I had a, um, we were, we were brainstorming about ideas for the title of a new show that I'm working on. And, and so we had these sort of like, you know, I, I kind of said, okay, there's a couple of ideas that consciously just like inputted them into my brain. And then so now I'm, I'm just going to not think about it. Maybe tomorrow, you know, something will come up. I had said that yesterday. And then today, you know, this morning, I was suddenly I'm like, oh, it could be this title or that title or this title. You know, it just sort of, uh, you can kind of feel it marinating in the unconscious. And so I think a lot of our big decisions we make, or even little ones that <laughs> it's, it's both with decision making and with creativity, allow your unconscious, it knows what it's doing. Let it do the work it can be much more creative than our limited um, conscious. Consciousness is good for certain things, but not for creativity. For creativity, it's very hard to think and make, okay, be creative now. I got to be creative right now on demand. But because creativity is almost like you get into these flow states. It feels like it's coming outside of you, through you. You turn down parts of your brain that have to do with your sense of self and time and place. And that's when you're accessing some of these unconscious processes that are involved in creativity. Mm -hmm. So uh, finally, 
uh, we've been talking here a lot about psychiatry and neuroscience, so mostly about your academic work, and you also have some clinical practice. So uh, apart from that, you're also, of course, a science communicator, and you even mentioned there just a few seconds ago that you're working on a new show. So, But as a science communicator, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges of doing it, particularly keeping in mind that usually the target audience is more of a the general population instead of just scientists or academics or university students. That is, people that are not really versed in science, usually. So the question is, what are some of the challenges with that? Or... Yes, yes yeah. the challenges. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's one of the biggest challenges is trying to stay true to the science and speaking about it in a way where you're not like, you're not dumbing it down, but you know, I, I, I know, but you are um, synthesizing it, summarizing it, you know, talking about it in ways that are more relatable that, um, and it's actually hard to do. It's hard to take in all this complex, complicated information, sort of digest it and then kind of spit it out in a way that is, again, true to the science, but spoken in sort of less scientific terms. I mean, you can use scientific terms, but you want to make it relatable using, like, I use a lot of analogies, for example, you know, just to make it relatable to people. And then also, one of the challenges is to also get people to want to care about it. Like a lot of the biggest question is like, well, why should I care? Whenever I'm trying to explain a scientific concept, whatever, which I think is really cool or a new discovery, which I think people would really like to hear about. I have to think, I always have in the back of my mind, the question of like, so what? So what does it matter to me? Because a lot of scientists think it's so great because they're interested in that topic. But like, if you're not inherently interested in just like, the the knowledge for the sake of knowledge um you have to think like what it, how would it be really how would it how is this important to just the average person who is not a scientist um and i think people are, are are smarter than we give them credit for and they're more curious than we give them credit for but you just have to make it relatable so they'll want to care to listen to it you know um but I really enjoy science communication because I just, it's such a thrill when you see somebody learn about something, which you think is like, oh, it's common knowledge. Like, of course, everyone knows like what the amygdala does or whatever. And then I was like, it's like, you know, people are like, well, what's an amygdala, right? It's like, cause you're so in your little silo, you don't realize that. And like, you know, so you can explain fight or flight. And like, you know, when you get triggered by something, there's something actually happening in your brain when you're emotionally triggered. And this is how we can work on helping you self-regulate it. And, um, so we can use findings in neuroscience and psychology to help people in their daily lives. And, and I think that's really just important because why are we doing all the scientific work anyway, if it's not, if it's not utilized, you know, by the general public. So um, I really enjoy the science communication. You know, I, I had a show that came out this year, a Nova series on the brain um, called your brain, which I'm really proud of. Um, I'm working on a new show now, which is still under wraps, but maybe by next year, be able to announce it. Um, working on a book also, which is in process. Um, so maybe by next year, um, but, but it's going to, you know, there's a couple of things in the works um, that I'm excited about, but um, the Your Brain series is a two-part series on Nova, um, covers a lot of the stuff that we talked about today in terms of, especially with consciousness and unconscious processes. Um, we go into the OR, you know, we put somebody under, under anesthesia and like see like how do we control consciousness we can turn it off we can turn it on you know um and just doing it in a very i like the visual medium of you know people seeing it and you're taking people places and you're talking about the science but but there's you know <clears throat> real patients there and and you can see what their experiences are like um and i think that's a great way kind of an oliver saxian type of way to get people to care and be interested in the science Great. So uh, I guess that I'm also looking forward to the new show and the book. So Dr. Berlin, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure. Yeah. Um, 
I have uh, an Instagram account, which is at Heather underscore Berlin. And also um, I'm on Twitter or now it's called X. Um, also at Heather underscore Berlin. I have a website, heatherberlin.com. Um, and yeah, so you can find most of what I'm up to there. I haven't gone so far as have TikTok yet, <laughs> although I've been told I should, but I think, I don't know, I just missed it generationally, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, great. So I'm leaving links to that in the description box of the interview. And thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. I've been a very big fan of your work, so it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com and also please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perurgo Larson, Jerry Muller, Ernst, Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Forrest Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinacio, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Kavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andre, Francis Forti, Agnun, Svergor Kossen, Hal Herzog, Nun, Machado, Jonathan Labyrinth, John Linhar, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Weyre, Tom Hamel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavlos Tazewski, Nelek Bakka, Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, George Stephanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles de Moray, Alex Shaw, Maury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Erringbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dovner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley, Kate Van Goller, Alexander Hubbard, uh, Liam Dunaway, B.R. Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, Mike Lavigne, and Dios Necht. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egden, Bernard Ignick, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Alni Cortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, Bogdan Canivets and Rosie. Thank you for all.